Hello and welcome to Newsmakers on CHCH Podcast. I'm your host, Louis Butko, and on today's show, we're continuing our look at the Ontario Liberal leadership race as we welcome candidate and MPP for Kingston and Thousand Islands, Ted Shu, to the show. A graduate of Queen's University with a PhD in physics from Princeton University, Shu spent most of his career in the private sector before being elected as an MP in 2011, where he served one term before leaving to spend more time with his family. But he remained an active member of the community before running for the Ontario Liberals in 2022, when he was just one of eight Liberals elected to Queen's Park, making him the only leadership candidate who currently holds a seat there. And uh, Mr. Shu, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, it's great to be here. Uh, let's talk about that. Being the only candidate who actually has a seat at Queen's Park, does that give you an advantage in this race? Well, what it means is that I can face uh, the Ford government and his ministers whenever the legislature is sitting. I can put questions, written questions, on what they call the order paper. The government has to answer them. Hmm. If the ministers are coming to committee, I can question them. I can also put motions and private members' bills. I can use the media studio and the press gallery is just upstairs. So there are definite advantages to having a seat that I will make use of. But the other thing I'd say is, you know, there's people coming to me saying, I can't afford the rent increase next month. I can't afford my groceries. I just lost my family doctor. Do they want to wait until 2026, hmm. the next election, to have us do something? No, I want to be able to say, okay, I'm going to be asking the minister. I'm going to be putting pressure on the government uh, for you. W whatever, it's not like I can wave a magic wand and solve your problem, but I'm going to be putting pressure right away, and that's what having a seat. Are you making that case strong enough, though? I mean, are you, are you, are you making that point that, hey, if it is one of these other three people, mm -hmm. they'll need to run in a by-election. That's more time, that's more money, that's more resources, because I, I feel like, you know, we had Mr. Erskine-Smith here, and he said, yeah, you know, I, it doesn't really hurt me not being uh, an MPP right now. They're going to have to run a different kind of uh, campaign, shall we say, leading hmm. up to 2026. Uh, they'll, they will, I guess, be talking, spending a lot of time outside the legislature, no direct contact hmm. with uh, Premier Ford and his, and his ministers, more going around talking to people. I mean, I would be, if I were leader, I would be doing the same thing. Hmm. So it would just be a different style, but I think that people want to see a potential leader right there uh, up against the ministers, questioning them on their behalf. Um, you are obviously well accomplished in your you know, personal career. You didn't get into politics until your 40s. You worked at Morgan Stanley, the Bank Nationale de Paris, um, science. You're, you're a smart guy. Why do you even want to be a politician? Well, we're facing a, real, a lot of really hard problems. Uh, affordability, cost of living, housing, our health care system in quotes, because <laughs> it's not really functioning well as to call it a system. Uh, our economy is not working. We have a shortage of skilled labor. You know, 50% of people in Ontario are living paycheck to paycheck. And I think, you know, we had this family conference before I uh, decided to do this run. And my older daughter put it, I think, best. She said, she's 20 years old. Me and my friends, we just want somebody to do something. They can read the papers, uh, young people like my daughter. They can see the problems. Uh, that they're inheriting. They can see that there's a, uh, more government debt now than when I was a kid, uh, which limits their options. So they want somebody to do something. That's what motivates me. And the other thing, why does it have to be me? Because we're, we're in a bad situation, so maybe you need a different kind of political leadership. So I have uh, a really different background. I'm not like any politician that people have seen. I worked a lot a of politicians long say that, though. <laughs> well, I worked a long time. <laughs> so I'll make my case. Sure. I, I worked a long time outside of politics. I, I worked in science. I worked in business. And I worked in environment all before going into politics. Uh, I also was on the Kingston Mayor's housing task force uh, when I wasn't in uh, running for politics. So. I also am somebody who represents both rural and uh, urban voters. And so there's a bit of a tension in our society, a bit of polarization between rural and urban. And I want to bridge that because any kind of polarization in our society, um, whether it's rich, poor, urban, rural, young, old, I'm a member of the sandwich <laughs> generation. I have parents and aunts to take care of as well as kids. 
I, I'm the guy who can fight against that polarization. I have a reputation in my home riding of Kingston and the Islands of being somebody who uh, gets support from people who lean towards different parties, who, work, who tries to find middle ground and work with the other parties. So I'm a problem solver. I'm not a career politician. I spent the first 40 years of my life outside of uh, politics. And that's the different kind of uncommon politician that we need mm. uh, in this very special time when we're faced with so many hard questions. I mean, even, e even leaving after one term at the federal level, that's not something people normally do. Um, <laughs> you were one of only you know, 34. You, you seem to have this habit of going in where your party doesn't do well, but you find success. How can you translate your individual success party politics into getting the Liberal Party yeah. relevant again? Well, you're very right that I, I won my federal seat in 2011, and it was the worst ever defeat for the federal Liberal Party. But I not only won, I increased the Liberal mm -hmm. vote. And I got votes from people who were leaning towards other parties, NDP, Green, Red Tories. And I, that's what I want to do across the province. Be somebody that's really different, that's practical and a problem solver. Like, I want to work on your problems. Uh, and attract people from different parties, and I want to help the Liberal Party win in the same way that I did in 2011 in the next election. It is a tall challenge. So h how do you make Liberals relevant again? I think it's important to go and visit and meet people and listen to them. I've been traveling around the province for, for over a year. Uh, I think it's important to, you know, it's easy to come up with good policy ideas, but do people really trust you? Mm. And to earn trust, one thing that needs to be done is we need to travel around, meet people in person, let them ask the hard questions, even the questions that I can't answer, uh, so they can poke and prod and really see who I am. Uh, I also don't like to exaggerate when I criticize the other parties, because I want to be believed when I do. That's another way to earn trust. Uh, I want to put out some, some bold policies, like building building housing, making uh, more dense urban areas. Uh, there's going to be some pushback because there, people are going to be worried about, is there enough parking? Is it going to change my neighborhood? Very valid concerns. But I want to treat housing like a crisis. So I, I'm willing to lose a couple of votes by people who are worried about my fearless housing policy because there's a lot of people who want, I want to trust mm. that our party is going to treat the housing crisis like a crisis. How would you say the Ford government has done when it comes to building houses? We've heard the term 1.5 million homes. I'm sure you've heard that yes. as much times as yeah. I, as many times as I have. How has he handled this last few months? Well, we're, we're not on track to get to 1.5 million homes. And, you know, his campaign slogan last year was get it done. And it just seems that in the last few weeks, he's trying to get it undone. He's been backtracking on his moves in the Green Belt, the ministerial zoning orders, uh, the changes of the city's official plans, often without the agreement of the city council. So he's had to backtrack. So he's losing time. Uh, and uh, that is not good for our housing hmm. situation. He's also building, I think, not encouraging the building of smaller, um, more affordable uh, housing units. If people just want a place they can call their own, that they can afford. Hmm. Uh, and he's not encouraging the building of that kind of housing. Well, the federal liberals have talked about co-op housing, and you know Pierre Polyev of the federal conservatives took that as, I, I believe his term was Russian-style housing when it comes to co-op. But what is the solution to housing? I mean, it's a big, it's yes. a big question. Well, what where I'd would like you to, start? I would like to build more density, so allowing. Uh, three story, three or four story apartments, four units, uh, townhouses, uh, mixed neighborhoods, more density, especially around arterial roads and transportation hubs like train, bus, train stations, bus transfer stations, um, but also mixed neighborhoods, different kinds of housing. We have different kinds of families, um, different sizes, and but we need to build something that's affordable. So it's going to be smaller, more modest, more neighbors, different neighbors, um, and we're going to preserve green spaces as well. Um, what are the biggest issues you're hearing about on the campaign trail, province-wide, you know, person in northern Ontario is having the same struggle as the person in southwestern Ontario? What, what's the common ground you've seen in the last five months, maybe outside of housing, which we've discussed a little bit already? It's uh, health care is very good. We have a shortage of health care professionals everywhere in the province. I have to say it's worse in the north. Hmm. It's worse in rural areas, but it's especially bad in northern Ontario. And I think we need to have incentives uh, to encourage um, people to work in the north, but also incentives for people from the north to go to school into the healthcare professions mm. because they're more likely to practice in the north. I was in Wawa. They have uh, space for seven doctors. They only have two.
Mm. So just imagine how hard I happen to know that mm. couple there. They're married. They're, they live in Wawa. Uh, they're doing the work of that could be spread out over seven doctors. So they're doing all sorts of different things that family doctors in southern Ontario don't even have to do. Of course, Wawa, just a little north of Napanee. Uh, we used to have a family cottage up there, so I'm uh, glad you brought up Wawa. Well, it's the one uh, by Nipigon. It's the one yeah. place. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the one place. I think there's a little beer, beer LCBO convenience store I, I, I'm very familiar with uh, up there in Wawa. Uh, let's talk about the news of the day, news of the hour, really, as you were uh, walking in, basically. Yeah. I'm sure as you were driving here, uh, your fellow, two of your fellow candidates, Nate Erskine-Smith and uh, Yersir Nakvi, have collaborated to present a what they are calling a principled, pragmatic, liberal alternative. Uh, they're saying, quote, we are asking our supporters to select each other as their number two choice when they fill out their ranked ballots. Uh, what's your reaction to that? Well, I was asked, I was invited to to um, be part of this, and but I, I decided not to. And the reason is it doesn't represent uh, this fresh start that mm. I want the Ontario Liberal Party to have. See, the, the party just a few months ago decided to go to a new system where every party member gets to vote and gets to look at all of the leadership candidates, scrutinize them and rank them. And, and I think that's what should happen. The voters should look at all the candidates and the voters should decide. Uh, and so, you know, the old style where you go to a convention, you have some deals, I'll go, f mm. I'll, go I'll support you, you support me, you do this for me. Uh, that's kind of, that's not what I want. That's not part of my vision for the future of a new uh, revitalized Liberal Party. Yeah, so um, it seems like the way they phrase it, it seems like it's a anybody but Crombie. <laughs> That's what people I've talked to are looking at that and saying, like, yes. well, this is to get in front of Bonnie Crombie. She's running. You've b debated her. What, what do you what's the sense you get from her? Well, you know, people see Bonnie Crombie as as uh, the mayor of a large city. And uh, I think one of the things we need to do is look at, like, has she been a good mayor? That's part of the scrutinizing that mm. has to has to happen. Um, I am not an anybody but uh, Bonnie Crombie person because I want to present, like, I'm in politics because yeah. I want to present something that is uh, positive and different. Like, I want to present something, not run against somebody else. Mm. Because I think when we go into the general election, we have to be presenting something to voters. So I want I'm putting it together now, and I'm testing it out with the liberal members. So I'm not just going to be against somebody else. Regardless of who wins, then, who is named, the voting is taking place uh, November 25th, 26th. There will be a convention in Toronto in which the votes are unsealed, and, and a winner is announced. Like you said, there's none of that active campaigning at the convention, how does the party move forward, regardless of who the leader is? If it's you, if it's somebody else, how does the party move on starting December 3rd, 2023, with 2026 in, in the foreground? I think what we want to do is start the process of uh, selecting candidates. We want to start the process of putting together policy that we want to carry into the next election. Actually, I'd like to develop some, like, agree on some policy bef way before <laughs> the next election, because I want voters to know, like, what the Liberal Party stands for. I don't want to wait until the, the last minute to, to announce our policies. Uh, so those are the two uh, big things that I'd like to do. I, I think the Liberal Party uh, needs a lot of fixing. Mm. And whether or not I'm the leader, but especially if I'm the <laughs> leader, I want to fix the Liberal Party, change it, and make it better. Well, a lot of people will look at 2026 and think that is so far away. Like, that is not something on my radar. The, the obvi it's, it's obvious the, the Ford conservatives have had a, a rough couple of months, mm -hmm. but they have reversed some decisions, and the polling suggests that it's not hurting them as much as people would suggest. Is there a sense that 2026 is so far away and that this election is happening now that it is going to be difficult to m either get, trend, uh, get traction or maintain traction towards 2026? Well, from the Liberal Party point of view, whoever the new leader is has to get well known across the province. Mm. So we do have to use all the runway that we have in two and a half years is what we'll have uh, to really get across the province. And earlier I said, we got to meet people in person to earn people's trust. And meeting people in person takes time, but it's really um, important time to take. Where is the opportunity for the Liberal Party to get PC voters on your side, you know, I talked to, like I said, when I was talking to Nate Erskine-Smith, I, I brought up, you know, maybe people like that, that Miss Crombie is more 
center than than some of the other candidates. How do you get some voters who who are staunchly conservative on your mm -hmm. side? Well, I there are certain uh, groups that I uh, think that the Liberal Party should be able to talk to, and I particularly uh, me as a leader. One of the things I did was I put out uh, agricultural policy separate from rural mm -hmm. policy, mm -hmm. separate from northern policy, uh, and it's about preserving farmland. And so that's something that I think li the Liberal Party and farmers have in common. I have a business background, so I find it very easy to talk to people about business, about economics, uh, and that's another uh, group of conservatives, not so ideological. They want to know that somebody's going to be competent and understand the uh, economy. I put out my economic policy way before anybody else. Mm. So those are some ways that we can reach out. Uh, and you're, you mentioned the science, uh, your science background as well. Climate change is an issue that affects a lot of people. You mentioned your 20-year-old daughter. That it seems to be the next generation that that has the most concern about what our climate's going to look like. How do we move forward with smart climate thinking mm -hmm. plans while also being financially smart yes. about things like right. that? That is that is key. Um, that we have to be very careful about the costs and, and benefits. So I've worked in sustainable energy. I ran a sustainable energy association. I mean, it was it was a professional and technological based uh, association. So we had companies, we had uh, utilities, we had students who were looking for jobs and employers who were looking for employees. Um, so one of what I think we need to do is we should focus on where we're going backwards. And right now, the province's plan is to build a lot more natural gas burning uh, mm. plants. We I think it's great to have natural gas to cover those uh, peak periods or times when the other forms of electricity are not available. But we need to be more aggressive in building out solar and wind power and energy storage so that we uh, don't have to rely so much on fossil fuels burning natural gas all day long to cover our base load needs. So yeah. that would be like a first practical step. Do you think people have forgotten about the canceled windmill plants early on in this, this government's tenure? Uh, there were a lot of green energy projects yeah. that were straight up canceled. Is that something you'd bring back to the foreground or are you past? No, I, past I would want to bring that back because we're, we're still paying for it and here's why. Um, because uh, the Ford government canceled renewable energy projects, actually dismantled, paid money to dismantle them and didn't and canceled uh, conservation programs and didn't move ahead with energy storage. We are now trying to go back and do those things, but many years later. And what's changed? Well, there's a lot more inflation. Like all sorts of heavy industrial equipment costs way more. And the United States has this big Inflation Reduction Act. They're uh, spending billions of dollars buying this infrastructure and they're ahead of us in the line. So we're gonna be behind the line, we're gonna be uh, paying more, we're gonna be getting less because they're buying it ahead of us. So this is the, it's we're, we're paying for it now and that's why, how I'm gonna remind people. Um, I had, when I've talked to liberals and liberal candidates, I have comments and I don't read the comments often, but the one refrain I hear is, why would anyone vote liberal again? A lot of people look at federal politics, Justin Trudeau, not a very popular person right now. Um, what would your answer be to that? If party politics seems to be so divisive now, and I've, yes. I've uh, had guests where I've wondered about the Americanization mm -hmm. of politics here in mm -hmm. Canada. A, are you seeing that, that, that we are going towards a more divisive party A, party B, mm -hmm. and in Canada, party C, going at each other aggressively, and how do we combat that so that we don't mm -hmm. have this rhetoric that gets violent at times? Yeah. I, I do see this polarization, and I am worried about it. And I'm especially worried about it because we have these really hard problems. Uh, all of these things could be called crises, cost of living, uh, housing, health care, climate. Um, we have all these crises, and so we really need to bring as many people together as we can to solve them. Every thing that polarize us, polarizes us makes it harder to get that political will to, okay, let's get, to get together. And, yeah. and it's like if, let's say, the, there was a war coming up, like, you yeah. wouldn't want to be all divided, right? So this is uh, making it hard for us to fight these crises. So how do we change that? Well, I'm offering somebody who is different from anybody you've seen in the past, and I think we need to earn trust. What about the liberal brand? Well, there's some things that I think people still believe in. One is equality of opportunity. That's very central to the liberal brand. The second thing is that liberals want to change things to make them better. And I think one thing that I would like to emphasize that I think doesn't get emphasized enough is that liberals should be the party that wants to change things, but 
wants to be humble about it. Like we should be saying like, we don't always know the answer. So let's check with people. Let's check with people with experience. Let's check with people who've, who are experts uh, and not assume that we're always right. And that humility, I think, will help us uh, earn back trust and earn back the trust of voters. Uh, I've always said that uh, there's a reason I'm hosting this show and I'm not a guest on this show is because I know nothing. So I bring in people who do know things. So thank you for coming on. Uh, before we go though, why do you deserve to be the next premier of Ontario? What, it's a, it's a tough job. Mm -hmm. Half the province is likely not going to have a high opinion of you. Why do you deserve? Why do you want to be the next premier? I, I would I would not use the word deserve. I think I have to I have to earn it. And I like we're the third party in the legislature, and I've I've been in that position in federal politics too. So we've got to work very very hard to uh, regain the trust of voters and to be able to earn uh, every single vote. That's a lot of uh, door knocking and organization and and fundraising and so on. Um, but what I will say is. Uh, the Liberal Party needs somebody to unify Liberals at the end of this leadership contest. I'm the person who can do that. The Liberal Party needs a leader who has a lot of experience and competence, and I have that outside of, of politics and science and business, environment and housing. Uh, and the Liberal Party needs to draw votes from, from other parties and, and be somebody who can really reach out to all sorts of different voters. And I have a really diverse background, and that's how I'll help the Liberal Party. Ted Shu, I appreciate making the time. I know you're very busy. In a debate last night in Ottawa, you made it down here uh, in you know 12 hours flat uh, with some sleep in there, I'm sure. But uh, we appreciate you coming on the show. We really do. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. That is Ted Shu. My thanks to him for joining me on today's show, and my thanks to you as well because we could not do the show without your support. Make sure you like and subscribe to CHCH Podcast wherever you found this show, so you never miss an episode. Or you can go to chch.com/podcast. I'd like to thank my director Chantel for directing today, and once again, my thanks to you for joining us. From all of us here at CHCH, I'm Louis Butko. Have a great day.